Hello, I just finished reading this book, House of Leaves, and I want to talk about it. It's a cool looking book, right? I'm sure there are plenty of other reviews on House of Leaves out there by people that are more literarily savvy than I am, but I thought it would be interesting to get a novice's perspective of it. When I say novice, I don't mean I'm just learning how to read, but this book is made with a lot of symbolism and is meant to be interpreted to some extent from what I can tell, and I'm not very practiced or very good at that type of interpretation. I tend to prefer literal books that you can just read through from beginning to end and don't really need to read a second time to understand a lot of what is actually going on. One note, I should probably read the book again before I do this review but I'm not going to do that. It's really good, but it's also very depressing, and it's pretty long. With that in mind, take everything I say here with a grain of salt. Depending on how this video goes, I may make a second video after I read a lot of other people's interpretation of the book to see what is different about mine and what I read online, especially if I missed any major through lines to the book. That could be interesting. I'm going to be outlining the plot as I understand it, so if you don't want spoilers, definitely pick up the book and read it before this. I will put some disclaimers here as far as the contents of the book. The book is incredibly sexual and violent. It is certainly for adults, not for children. It has massive amounts of existential dread that are a main theme of the book. So if you're not into any of that, maybe skip it. Another warning, there is assault of the sexual kind and there are people taking their own lives in the book. If you don't like that, you should probably also skip it. As a final warning, the pacing of the book is a little bit weird. There are parts where the most exciting part of the book will happen and then it will go into a synopsis of echoes and the metaphysical importance of echoes for 30 pages or so. And if that sounds frustrating and not fun, then you could probably also skip it. Other reasons that I'm making this video and basically an outline for what I'm trying to do in this video is I haven't made any longer YouTube videos. I would like to try to do that and see how hard it is to do. I also want a video with some music in it. So if you're hearing music now, then I succeeded in that. It may be music that I wrote or music that I found on a site. I'll put in the description of the video, which one it is. I would also like to put some pictures of the book in the video. I don't know exactly what the rules are of that. And hopefully I don't break any rules I'm unaware aware of. And finally, like I said, there is some subject matter that is very dark in this book, and I'm going to see if I can avoid YouTube just kicking my video off of YouTube right away as soon as I upload it based on things that I go over. So why do I want to talk about this book at all? The closest book that I've read to this is Infinite Jest, and once I completed Infinite Jest, I was frustrated and immediately went online to see what people were interpreting the book was actually about. That was fine, but it took some of the magic out of the book. I think with books that have complex narratives, you're supposed to ruminate with them for a bit to try to figure out what happened. So I feel like I did a bit of a disservice to Infinite Jest by going in and just reading what other people thought it was about. I don't want to make that mistake with this book. As a side note, an interesting video that somebody could make is maybe comparisons between Infinite Jest and House of Leaves. I know quite a bit about David Foster Wallace and his life. I've read a few of almost biographical books of his. I don't know much about the author of this book, Mark Z. Danielewski, but my guess is that both him and David Foster Wallace grew up in houses that were filled with books and literature and that reading was a major part of their childhood. Anyway, one of the main reasons that I'm doing this is so that I have to nail down what my interpretations of the book are before I actually look up stuff online. I think that will be kind of interesting. Here's a plot summary of the book. I'm gonna keep the scope pretty tight, otherwise the video is gonna be 10 hours long. So the book is by Mark Z. Danielewski, but inside of the first page of the book, it says that it's by Zampano with notes and an introduction by Johnny Truant. There's also a note from the editors that claim that this is an improvement on the first edition with additional notes and quotes added to the back of the book. It's interesting because this is a type of world building. It seems like it's made by some small print shop and it's not the actual editors of the book commenting here. It's in world editors. In order for any of this to make sense, I'm gonna reveal some of the architecture of the book at this point. There are basically three books in the House of Leaves and I'll define them now so I can keep them straight. There's Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves, which is the actual book itself. There's Zampano and Johnny's House of Leaves, which is an in-world House of Leaves that is internal to the book that Mark wrote. And there's Zampano's The Navidson Record, which is written by Zampano and found by Johnny. Zampano may have intended for the Davidson record to be part of a book called The House of Leaves, but it makes it a lot easier to keep track of if Johnny Truant is the author of The House of Leaves and The Navidson Record is a internal structure internal to that book. Johnny is the main character of The House of Leaves, both the book written by Mark and, in reality, the book written by Zampano and Johnny. Johnny is a bit of a loser. He lives in a crummy apartment in California, and he works at a tattoo parlor. Johnny's best friend is Lude. He's a barber. 
they are degenerates in their early 20s that are really only looking to get stoned and get laid. From the subtext of the book, Johnny is pretty attractive. He seems to have quite a lot of charm with the ladies. As a bit of his visual appearance, they describe that he has a cracked front tooth and he has scars all over his forearms. Lude lives in some condos that he wants Johnny to live in, and he mentions that there's an old man that goes for walks in the courtyard there named Zampano that is probably on his way out pretty soon, as in he's gonna die pretty soon. Zampano is blind and basically a hermit from what Lude can tell. The cats that follow Zampano when he's going on walks start disappearing or showing up mutilated. Soon after the cats start disappearing, Zampano is found dead in his apartment. Zampano seems to have died of old age, but there is a giant claw mark on the floor next to where Zampano's body is. Zampano's condo is a mess, Lude is helping the owner clean it out and find something that he really wants to show to Johnny in Zampano's apartment. The thing that Lude finds in Zampano's apartment is a large chest that is filled with papers that are a story that Zampano was seemingly putting together. All of these papers make up the Navidson record. The story is about a family of four, Will Navidson, Karen, Chad, who's eight, and Daisy, who's five, their children. Will and Karen are not married and have had relationship issues. It's hinted at fairly early. Will Navidson is an acclaimed photographer and Karen is a model. Will has seemingly been absent a lot pursuing his career goals. He seems to be a workaholic and he decides to record the family in their house using cameras and motion detectors as a continuation of his photography career. To add a layer of confusion, the Davidson Record is a book written by Zampano, and it's also the name of a movie that is made by Will Davidson out of this footage that he's getting from the house that they've just moved into. At this point in the story, importantly, Johnny chimes in through footnotes inside of the Davidson Record and mentions that the Davidson Record is not a real movie and that Will Davidson does not exist. None of the family does. As an aside to explain the structure of the book here, there are mentions of publications like LA Weekly that are real in our world and in Johnny's world, and they're just kind of spattered throughout the book, making it seem that Will and Karen are real people, and this is a story that is written in the aftermath of the Davidson record, the movie, being released. Johnny adds footnotes to the book as well, using it kind of as a diary that is interleaved inside of the Navidson record story itself, or the House of Leaves, as it's called, once it is published, internal to the book, The House of Leaves, written by Mark. The house begins to exhibit strange behavior. A closet is created while the family is gone, in between the children's room and the master bedroom. There are doors on both sides, and internal to the room, the walls are black ash gray is how they're kind of described. Once the closet appears, Will decides something strange is going on with the house and measures an interior wall, and then an exterior wall and finds that the interior wall is slightly longer than the exterior wall, seemingly breaking the laws of physics. Once Will discovers this, he calls his brother Tom and a man named Billy Reston, who's a college professor, to come over and take a look at the house with him. From a brief description, Tom is Will's twin brother and he's kind of a loser. He hasn't had a successful career the way that Will has with his photography. Kind of schlubby and he smokes pot. As they are exploring this small change to the house that has seemingly broken the rules of physics along one wall and this closet that has appeared seemingly out of nowhere, a new addition to the house appears in the living room, a door that opens to a hallway that wasn't there previously that seems to change size from about 10 feet deep to seemingly endless and since it's on an exterior wall you would think that you'd be able to see that the hallway was there when you went outside of the house but they can't when you go outside the wall is just like it was previously but on the inside there's a door that they can open and there's a hallway there the hallway has the same dark colored walls as the closet does and they make a point of saying there aren't any outlets or any other standard things that you would expect along a wall anywhere in the closet or along this hallway the hallway not being present in the exterior of the home is explored in a short film called the five and a half minute hallway where will navidson takes footage interior to the house and then goes out of a window walks around the entire house showing that nothing is different outside goes back into the house and then films opening the door and looking into the hallway so that you can see that it's not a trick of any kind at this point it becomes pretty clear that will really wants to explore the hallway but karen absolutely does not want him to okay so quick break that was a lot and i'm gonna slow things down a little bit and go over points that i may have missed i didn't describe billy reston very well billy reston is a black 
paraplegic college professor, and Will Davidson actually captured the moment that he lost his ability to use his legs. A power line fell in an accident and hit him, and he ended up losing the ability to use his legs. He's in a wheelchair. And Reston has the picture that Will took of him actually losing his legs hung up in his office. And it seems like he has a bit of a sense of humor about it now that he's learned to cope with it. So uh, Karen doesn't want Will to go into the hallway because it's potentially dangerous and she doesn't want her children to grow up without a father. This is the kind of behavior that Will specifically displayed a lot when he was a photo, he's a photojournalist not just a photographer, but he's known for having a great eye for photography. Anyway, he went into a lot of dangerous situations in that career, and Karen doesn't want him to do that anymore. She really doesn't want him to go into the hallway. Will has been in the hallway. His daughter helped him find his way out because she was crying at the entrance, and he doesn't want to tell Karen about it, but he has an idea of what the hallway is like. When he was in there, the hallway was very large and change shapes multiple times, making him almost lose his way back to the entrance. At some point, it is made clear that Karen was abused by her stepfather, and she was apparently placed in a well. She's terrified of the hallway because of that. She's claustrophobic, absolutely terrified of the hallway because it's similar to the way the well looked. Something to keep in mind about all this that I kind of touched on is that the Navidson record that Zampano wrote is a retrospective of the Navidson record that Will Navidson has created out of the footage of this house, including the hallway and seemingly a bunch of other stuff that happens, is in the movie. The book is well researched and has references sprinkled all throughout it in the footnotes. It's apparent that in this world, multiple college papers, books, and magazine articles have been written about the Navidson record, the movie, but all of that is just made up by Zampano. One important other note that I didn't put in from Johnny's diary entries is that Lude and Johnny go out at one point to a bar. They meet a lot of girls, and Lude throws out some basic prompts for a story that Johnny has to come up with on the spot, and Johnny mentions that that's a game that they play. Johnny has the ability to kind of weave stories out of anything that Lude throws at him and keep them interesting. The girls seem to enjoy this story quite a bit. It goes well. That's an important character trait to know that Johnny has. He's a very good storyteller. Okay, so back to the story. The next part of the story goes over several expeditions that take place into the hallway. Will hires some people based on Reston's recommendations, people that Reston has heard speak at the college that he works at. Their names are Holloway Roberts, Jed Leader, and Wax Hook. There are several expeditions into the hallway, and they find multiple rooms that are so large they are almost beyond comprehension. Just phenomenally large rooms. It's freezing in the hallways, and there is no light, and they have the same dark black walls that were described everywhere else, so it's a pretty ominous setting. The team, led by Holloway, is used to working on mountaintops, so they're used to pretty harsh conditions. One of the enormous rooms that they come upon has a giant spiral staircase in the middle of it that Holloway really wants to explore, and they go on an expedition they call the Fourth Expedition. The goal of the Fourth Expedition is to get to the bottom of the stairway and see what's down there. There's a growling noise that happens pretty often in the hallways on the other expeditions. There's speculation that the growling noise could be a creature, or it could just be the walls and the hallways reconfiguring themselves inside of the rooms. Once the team gets to the bottom of the stairway in the fourth expedition, Holloway seemingly loses his mind and starts running after the beast that he hears just around the corner. Jed and Wax try to coax him back to the stairway so that he doesn't just run off into the labyrinth. They can't get him to come back. Once Wax and Jed decide to leave Holloway behind, they start going back up the stairway. All of a sudden, Wax gets shot, Holloway apparently rounding a corner and seeing them, thinking that Wax is the beast. Holloway seems genuinely confused once he shoots Wax. He was pretty sure that he was the beast. After some justification, it seems like Holloway decides that he's just going to kill Wax and Jed. Jed runs away with Wax, and they hide in a room. At this point, the expedition is way overdue for returning back to the house, and Will is just sitting in the living room waiting for them, and he starts hearing a noise that sounds like an SOS being tapped out, coming through the walls of the house, even though the expedition team is likely miles away from anywhere near the house. The expedition team 
Jed in particular is tapping on the wall, but he doesn't remember actually tapping out SOS. Will, Reston, and Tom go into the hallway to try to rescue the expedition team. They navigate their way to the enormous room that has the stairway in it, and Tom gets to the stairway and is like, there's no way I'm going down there. However, something's happened to the stairway. It's much shorter than it was previously, like only 100 feet down. So Reston hops off of his chair, makes his way down on his hands, and Davidson brings his wheelchair down with him, and they get to the bottom, and they go to look for the team. Will hears some pitiful sounding moans behind a door, and it turns out that it's Wax and Jed. He breaks down the door, they get inside, and right then, Holloway finds the team and shoots Jed right in the face, killing him. Reston has a gun that Will didn't know about and starts firing back at Holloway. At that point, Holloway is seemingly swallowed by the house. The walls just change in the area that he's in, and he seemingly gets sucked away into some other portion of the hallways. Will and Reston bring Ned's body back and Wax to the base of the stairway. They're communicating through a radio through a lot of parts of this. The original expedition team wasn't able to use the radio to get all the way back to the living room, but with Tom at the top of the stairway, Tom can talk to Will, and he can talk to Karen in the living room so they're able to communicate to some extent. Will radios Tom and says, you need to help us get down to the bottom of the stairs and help us get Wax back up who's injured, Jed back up who's dead, and Reston who is in his wheelchair so he can't get up the stairs very easily. When Will and Reston, Jed and Wax get to the base of the stairway, Tom isn't there and Will is furious. A few minutes later, though, a rope falls down from the top of the stairway. Apparently, Tom was too afraid to go down the stairs, but he realized, I can run to the living room, get rope, run all the way back, and then help them up using the rope. Wax and Jed are raised up by the rope, and as Reston is getting raised back up, something happens to the stairway. It explodes back to the length that it was previously. The stairway, when the first expedition team went down, took days to navigate, and then it was only 100 feet deep, and then it explodes back out to seemingly even deeper. Either way, the stairway is much, much larger than it was. Reston does manage to get to the top of the stairway because the rope was anchored near the top, but Davidson is way at the bottom of a much larger stairway than what they originally navigated. In the meantime, Wax, Reston, Tom, and Jed's body work their way back to the living room. They immediately call the police. An ambulance comes and takes Wax to the hospital, and Jed's body is taken to a coroner. The sheriff comes in and starts to investigate. He takes about five steps into the hallway and then goes, I think this was a hunting accident, and leaves because he's terrified. Several days pass while Karen waits in the living room for Will to return from the hallway. Will eventually does show up at night, and he's exhausted, but he he lives. He makes his way out of the hallway. Once Will is back, everyone decides it is time to get out of this house. This is terrifying. They start collecting all the things that they need to go stay somewhere else. While they are packing everything up, the house begins to change, and the house becomes dangerous instead of just a hallway. Everyone is able to escape the house with the exception of Daisy and Tom. Tom makes his way into the kitchen carrying Daisy, gets Daisy out of the window to Will. Tom starts trying to run and jump out the window, but the house seemingly doesn't want to let him go. It sucks the floor out from underneath him and pulls him back, and then the walls in the kitchen come collapsing in, crush Tom's arms. Tom stands there looking at Will, knowing that the house isn't going to let him go for one reason or another, and then the floor opens up below Tom, and he just plummets out of Will's vision. I believe Daisy can see this too. Everyone else makes it out of the house, with the exception of Tom, who has his arms crushed and then falls into the floor. Okay, so another quick break and going over some notes and things that I may have missed. The uh, formatting in this part of the book is really cool. All during the expeditions, it's actually the thing that made me buy the book. The formatting is kind of a mystery as far as why would any book be printed that way. I'll probably show a couple pictures of it. It makes the hardback version of the book that I have really cool to own and just flip through. One thing I didn't mention is that Will finds Holloway's gear and that it has recordings of Holloway shooting himself and dying. So we know what happens to Holloway. One of the other things that wasn't very clear, I don't think, from what I was saying about them escaping the house was that Tom is for sure dead. The book alludes to it 
very strongly in some way. Again, there are several stories that Johnny is interleaving within the Navidson report that I'm leaving out that we'll revisit later. Johnny is kind of losing his mind at this point while putting together Zampano's book and still using footnotes as a diary. Another interesting thing about this section, there are several mentions of the story of the Minotaur that Zampano has apparently struck through inside of the writing. There's one interpretation of the Minotaur myth that Zampano revisits, which is that the Minotaur is actually the child of the king that built the labyrinth, and the child has some kind of physical deformity, and the king basically puts him into the labyrinth so that he doesn't have to deal with it. Yeah, those sections are struck through by Zampano like he didn't want them in the book, but Johnny included them anyway. One thing that I didn't make super clear, again, this is a book about a movie. A lot of the expeditions have footage behind them, and there's a lot of talk about cameras and batteries. For instance, Holloway's death is caught on film and shown very clearly in the movie. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes things that are introduced as well. Now we're getting to the end of the Navidson report. Again, this is the part that Zampano wrote. Karen creates a cut-down version of the film that she shows to a lot of famous people in our world, interestingly. There's Stephen King, Anne Rice, Steve Wozniak, Jacques Derrida, Hunter Thompson, Stanley Kubrick, David Copperfield, and Camille Paglia. There's brief clips that Karen puts together with all those people in a film called What Some Have Thought. As a brief aside, this is one of the more amusing parts of the book. There's a lot of jokes in this part that are pretty good. Will, at this point, convinces himself that he has to go back into the hallways, gathers a bunch of gear, including a bike and a cart that he can pull behind the bike that has a lot of his gear in it. When Will goes into the house this time, he finds that the house often helps him, seemingly. All of the floors have a slight decline in them so that the bike can go pretty quickly. And when he tries to turn around and go back uphill just because he wants to see how hard it will be, the floor again seems to tilt and let him go downhill, so he's always going downhill on the bike. Will doesn't seem to care that no matter what direction he goes is downhill at this point. He almost gives up and kind of lets the house take him wherever, even though he's getting hopelessly lost. At some point after Will sleeps, there is a window that he can see and he decides to crawl through it. The house previously has sucked up all of his gear except for what he was actually wearing. He goes through a window, ends up on a windowsill effectively, with just blackness all around him. Tries to stretch out his water, film, battery, and light as much as he can. He's reading a book and burning it at the same time, and he seems very accepting of the fact that he's gonna die. Karen finds out that Will has gone back into the house, and she goes and visits, seemingly overlapping with this particular time period of Will being out on the windowsill. She can hear him occasionally. She kind of blacks out and just appears in the front yard of the house with Will in her arms. Will is really close to death and it's freezing in the hallways so he loses his right hand to frostbite. He has several scars on his skin from the frostbite as well but he does recover. The actual release of the Navidson record is a bit fuzzy in the book from what I remember but Will does use this additional footage that he's put together for his last expedition in the Navidson record and puts out a final version of the film or maybe the first version. Again it's very difficult to tell exactly when it's released in the timeline. At least it was for me. It may be stated clearly somewhere, but maybe I missed it. Will and Karen raise Daisy and Chad, and that's the end of the Navidson record. The Navidson record release of the movie is basically the last point of the Davidson record book that Zampano has put together. Now back to Johnny in the House of Leaves, which again is Johnny's version of the Navidson report with his own notes inside of them, along with other stuff that he's gathered. At this point, everything that Zampano has written has been edited and cleaned up by Johnny, and it's apparently been published, we find out later, but not by any mechanism Johnny remembers. Johnny has been so impacted by the book that he lost his job and he's homeless. He's basically wandering through the United States and writing continued journal entries that are not part of the House of Leaves book. At some point during the writing of the House of Leaves, Johnny has completely cleaned up. He used to drink and do a lot of drugs, now he does not, but he still has trouble sleeping and he's kind of insane at this point. He's a bit of a shell of who he formerly was, having trouble telling what is real and what isn't. One of the journal entries that Johnny goes over while editing The House of Leaves talks about a girl named Kyrie. Kyrie apparently has a homicidal boyfriend that they call the Gansk. 
Man, which is apparently a city somewhere somewhere in Europe. I don't remember exactly where. At some point, Kyrie comes to Johnny and Johnny rejects her. She goes to the Gansk man and basically says, go and kill Johnny. When the Gansk man can't find Johnny, he finds Lude and beats the crap out of him. Lude ends up in the hospital. This is one of the things that breaks Johnny out of his isolation. Johnny actually goes to the hospital to visit Lude. Lude seems to have the perception that with a lawyer's help, he's going to be able to sue the Gansk man and live off of the money that he gets for the rest of his life. Instead, Lude becomes addicted to painkillers, crashes his motorcycle, and dies. One of the indications that Johnny is losing his mind here is he ends up writing about this twice. He does not remember that Lude died, even though he wrote extensively about it, and then says, I'm going to go visit Lude, Lude is dead later, completely forgetting this very important part of his life. The Gansk man and Kyrie end up finding Johnny at one point, and the Gansk man starts beating up Johnny, but Johnny gets back up, gets the better of him, and beats him to death with a whiskey bottle. At this point, he grabs Kyrie, who's in the car that the Gansk man jumped out of, takes her someplace, assaults her repeatedly, and then kills her as well. It's unclear if this actually occurs because there's no ramifications for it. It seems like killing a person in the open would absolutely get you caught. So at this point, you're really questioning whether or not what Johnny is saying is happening or not. Johnny ends up in Flagstaff listening to a local band, and they have a song called The Five and a Half Minute Hallway that Johnny hears and is immediately interested in talking to the band. Johnny assumes at this point that he's the only one that knows Zampano's book, and Five and a Half Minute Hallway is a major part of that book. While talking to the band, one of the band members motions at a bag that they have and says, yeah, the five and a half minute hallway is written as an homage to the book that's in there. Johnny pulls out the book and it's the first edition of The House of Leaves, which he does not remember publishing. Johnny does not mention that he's the editor of The House of Leaves to the band and just leaves the bar. At this point also, Johnny says, I finally got some help from some doctor friends of mine in Seattle. I'm feeling so much better and my life is going great now. And then a page later says, did you actually believe what I was saying? I didn't find doctor friends that I used to know and I'm not doing better. My life's a train wreck and will apparently never be better. These are some final notes from Johnny and the House of Leaves. One of the things I wanted to go over is Johnny has mentioned a lot about his childhood throughout the book, but it's very disjointed and it's hard to paint a whole picture of it. So I'm going to go over the memories that he has from being very young and up until he finds Zampano's book. One of his earliest memories is that Johnny spills oil or something that she's cooking on his arms, seemingly on accident, which causes the scars that he has on his arms. Johnny's opinion of this event seems to oscillate between thinking she maybe did it on purpose to it being a complete accident. Johnny also remembers bits of his mother having a mental illness probably schizophrenia, and her trying to strangle him at some point. We find out that it was when he was around seven years old and that she ended up in an institution after trying to kill him. Johnny's father has to take his mother to an institution, but before she leaves, she has a moment of clarity, kind of realizes that something's wrong with her, and says a very loving goodbye to Johnny. Leaving is really hard for her and really hard for his father and really hard for Johnny, clearly. It takes five and a half minutes for her to leave and he mentions this is the five and a half minute hallway. Johnny's father was a pilot but with his mother going through the trouble that she's going through he has to get a different job. He ends up being a truck driver and then he has an accident and dies. It's not clear if the accident was caused by sleep deprivation or drinking or anything like that. It was just an accident. At this point Johnny's mother is in an institution and his father is dead so he goes to live with another family and the father in this family is an ex-marine. Johnny gets in fights very often at school, which his father says is unacceptable. He gets into a few more fights, and finally the ex-marine father takes him out to the woods or somewhere and beats the crap out of Johnny, taking him to the hospital. And this is where Johnny gets his chipped front tooth. The ex-marine dies soon after of cancer, and at that point Johnny is old enough that he can run away to Alaska and starts working at a fishery up there. This is towards the end of the House of Leaves as far as Johnny using it as a diary. Johnny remembers very clearly at this point the incident with his mother strangling him and the very long goodbye that they had in the hallway. Johnny also recounts burning the House of Leaves that he had edited burning it page by page the way that Will did in the Navidson record. I'm assuming it was the original copy of the book, but there was another copy made that was actually published. 
Johnny's journal ends with a story being told by the fictional Seattle doctor that was supposed to have helped him and his mental trouble, but then ended up being an entire lie, meaning that this story is also just made up. The story that the doctor is telling, and again, this isn't a real person, so this is just a story that Johnny is telling, is about a mother who gives birth to a child who has some amount of brain damage and won't be able to survive. The story ends with the mother giving a goodbye to the child that is very similar to Johnny's mother giving him a goodbye inside of the hallway, and then the baby dies. The story about the mother and the baby is the last bit that Johnny writes in The House of Leaves. Everything beyond this is things that are gathered by the editors that put together a future version of The House of Leaves, not the first edition. This is the final edition with all of the gathered material that the editors could come up with. There are several pictures and poems inside of this edition and some writings by Zampano that give more of a hint of who he was. The most important part in these gathered additional materials are letters from Johnny's mother. Johnny's mother's name is Pelafina Heather Levere. Johnny's mother is in an institution at this point, but she writes him letters constantly, and they're very flowery and very well-written, very beautiful letters. She's aware of what is going on in Johnny's life, writes to details about it that he hints at inside of the entire story, and she's endlessly encouraging. She loves him to the point that she sees no fault in him at all. Every single thing that he does is great and beautiful. For instance, when he's getting into a lot of fights at school, she says, oh, you're such a powerful Viking. Of course, you decide to fight when it's necessary, but words might work too. Everything has that kind of tone. She claims multiple times that he has a brilliant mind and that he is a great storyteller. There's also hints here that Johnny actually does go and visit her a couple times while she's in the institution, and she obviously enjoys seeing him immensely. In one of the latest Later letters, she starts indicating that she's going to stop taking her medication, and the tone of the letters changes drastically. Once she stops taking her medication, it becomes very clear why she needs to be institutionalized. She's completely paranoid and schizophrenic. She believes that terrible things are happening to her in the institution and that she absolutely has to escape. And then she revisits trying to kill Johnny when he was seven and says, yeah, I really wish that had worked and had relieved you of the pain of existence. Her writing becomes incredibly scattered and interestingly formatted again, which reflects parts of the Navidson record that Johnny has edited and put together. My guess is that they are happening in parallel. It shows kind of a psychosis in an interesting way. Her writing gets more and more manic and frantic until finally they get her back on her medication and she says, oops, I realized I kind of lost my mind there. Everything is actually fine here. They are taking good care of me. And I actually believe that this is the truth. She is convincing in the other letters that terrible things are happening to her at the institution and she needs to escape. But there are additional letters from the institution itself that are written by the same doctor. He eventually is going to leave the institute and retire, but one of the main ideas that Johnny's mother puts out is that a new leader of the institution has come in and he's a demon. He's evil completely. And that just doesn't seem to be the case. She becomes incredibly unreliable at that point in her letters. She eventually gets back on medication, but there's another letter from the hospital at that point that says she's deteriorating pretty rapidly now and that she isn't going to be cognitively all there from now on more than likely. She again writes a lot of letters that believes that she is going to leave but this time with permission and that Johnny just needs to send her a couple suitcases so that she can pack up but this is also delusional. Finally after her mental state deteriorates to a certain point she decides the only way out is to hang herself and she hangs herself with her bed sheets inside of the institution and that's the last at least as far as I can tell, important narrative point of the book. So that was fun. Before I dive into the analysis of the book and discuss what I think actually happened in it, I want to say that to me it was a pretty fun read, but it was clearly incredibly dark. One of the reasons I didn't want to reread the entire thing before recording this. Before I get into the analysis, I want to reiterate that I'm not a literary scholar. I don't do analysis like this very often, so I'm probably going to miss some major threads. I almost always do with complicated narrative structures like this. There's some glaringly obvious thing that I'll read later that uh, I go, oh, yeah, that, that changes the way that I look at it quite a bit. So anyway, I'm going to do my best. I did 
scan through the book a lot more than I wanted to when I first started making this video, but there's a lot going on in it and a lot of little points that I kind of remembered. And I think by virtue of laying out the parts that I did in the summary, I basically outlined what I think is actually happening in the book pretty clearly. If you've read the book, you may have major plot points that I skipped completely over that you're like, oh no, this is crucial to the analysis of the book. And if so, I apologize. So to start the analysis, I think that Johnny Truant is dealing with trauma from his mother trying to kill him when he was seven, and she has died recently, so he needs to find some way to forgive her to the extent that he can, and that's really what the story is about. At the beginning of the story, he has no sense of direction or purpose in life, and that's because of hidden childhood trauma potentially that he hasn't dealt with. This point emphasizes that Johnny Truant is telling the entire story, and he is an incredibly unreliable narrator. The things that we know we can anchor in reality for the book are any notes that the editors make, because in World to the book The House of Leaves, the editors seem to be people that are objective observers of what Johnny actually went through, but they never chime in on, there's no evidence that the Gatsd man ever existed, things like that, that you would expect to be in there potentially. The editors are also the ones that introduce Johnny's mother's letters, which are one of the most important parts of the book. With Johnny being the main writer of the book, I start my analysis with the idea that potentially Zampano isn't real at all. Or if Zampano is real, he didn't write the entire Navidson report. A lot of it was stuff that Johnny made up, potentially. The chest he finds Zampano's story in kind of allows him to analyze his trauma from an academic and from a clinical point of view that is sterile and doesn't have a lot of emotion in it, which is maybe what he needs to get through thinking about the trauma that he went through. Some of it is also Johnny potentially having the same mental problems that his mother does, or at least related ones, which I, I think is schizophrenia without looking really deep into it, where reality is kind of fractured and it's difficult to tell the stories that you're telling yourself from reality. I think the real story is that Johnny got word that his mother died and then had a mental breakdown, basically. He became a recluse for several years and wrote The House of Leaves to help get through the trauma that he was experiencing. He does lose his job and his apartment in the book, and I think that's probably based on reality. He becomes homeless. He almost loses his mind entirely, but by the end, I think he's starting to get some connection back to reality. The editors do include some notes from Zampano that are collages and they dive into who Zampano was with some written quotes from him, so he may be real, but he might not be. Those notes may have been made by Johnny. It's difficult to tell. Parts of his life, like his friendship with Lude and the Gansk man and Kyrie, may be based on reality, or more than likely are, but the fact that he never got arrested or in any kind of trouble for killing two people kind of indicates that maybe that was just in his head too. So Johnny is writing a story about Zampano writing a story about Will Navidson who doesn't exist. And Will Navidson is making a documentary about his weird house. Will Navidson has two children, Chad and Daisy, who I think in some ways are stand-ins for Johnny when he was a child. They're not mentioned a lot in the book, but they are mentioned periodically as obviously being affected by everything that's happening to their family inside of the house. I think the hallways appearing and expanding are symbolic of existential dread and trauma in general. They are seemingly endless, unknowable, and unconquerable, and they make you feel helpless and small or they make Will and the people exploring it feel helpless and small. I think this is a pretty good analogy for when you feel overwhelmed by something catastrophically terrible that happens in your life. In the context of the story, it may be that Will and Tom's parents died or something like that, that is actually the trauma that they're experiencing, or just repressed childhood stuff. The reason I say it was something that happened to Will and Tom potentially is because they are the most directly impacted, and there's a lot of hints in the story that the hallways kind of bend to their will in in some ways, which is also true of trauma, I believe, as you're working through it. You have to force yourself to manage the size of it and make it to where it doesn't overwhelm you constantly or else you can't function anymore to the best of your ability. Clearly, I'm not saying if people are mentally strong enough, they should just be able to force their way through trauma. This book actually does a pretty good job of showing that trauma can completely destroy you if it's bad enough. It's one of those very debatable topics on how much responsibility should you take in improving your station in life when hit with a traumatic event that you had no say in. 
As a child, clearly, you cope with it the best you can. Johnny's mother's mental illness might be the beast that's mentioned in the book. The beast is kind of exchanged with the hallways themselves periodically, and it's never actually seen. It seems like impetus to the hallways or something that makes them more intelligent and menacing than just the hallways themselves. I think the characters in the story represent the way that different people deal with trauma. Will is a stand-in for Johnny and for Johnny's father, potentially. They see the trauma and they say, well, we have to figure out what this is. They look into it as much as possible and try to analyze their way out of it. Although I guess Johnny isn't really doing that. Well, indirectly he is. Tom is more the emotional side of Will. He saves Daisy, which is again potentially a stand-in for Johnny, but he's destroyed while doing that. Johnny mentions that he doesn't feel much of anything anymore, I think. When you go through severe trauma, sometimes emotional pieces of you die. Hopefully they come back. Again, recovery from trauma is important. Take care of yourself, whoever's watching this. I feel like this is getting really bleak, and some of this stuff is bleak. Inevitably, life has suffering in it, and you have to be able to deal with it to the best of your ability. Karen has had trauma before, too, with her stepfather abusing her and putting her in the well, but her coping mechanism seems to be to completely act like it didn't happen and never analyze it, which is kind of the way that she approaches the hallways as well. Let's not go there, and let's just continue our lives somewhere else. Rustin, through his accident and losing his ability to use his legs, has been through a traumatic experience that was life-changing, and he's on the other side of it, and he's doing pretty well, so as a friend of Will's, he's doing his best to help him out. Daisy and Chad are too young to understand exactly what's happening, which is the way that trauma looks from a child's point of view a lot of the time, I believe. They see the aftermath of a lot of the trauma, like Jed's body, they see the hallways, they know that they're there, but for the most part, I think the main thing they notice is that the adults just aren't paying as much attention to them as they were previously, so they kind of understand something is going on. It's distracting their parents from acting like they used to towards them, and showing them the attention and love that they were kind of used to, which again, I think is what children at the age of five and eight probably get from trauma most. I think Holloway and his crew are kind of a cautionary tale for what can go wrong, with trauma, in particular Holloway. Holloway seems to rail against the hallways and think they're kind of a culmination of a lot of unfair things that have happened in his life. He believes that he deserves to be in a better place in his life than where he is currently and feels almost entitled to being able to understand and explore them completely and it drives him insane. In the end, Will is permanently damaged by going into the house. He loses his right hand and his brother, but he does succeed in actually exploring the house to the extent possible, potentially resolving the trauma. He also does finish making the movie, which ends up being a huge cultural hit and the crowning achievement of his life. This is kind of interesting because in the world internal to the book, Johnny Truant's book also becomes very popular. And I think some of that has to do with the fact that humans like reading stories written by other people, especially symbolic type stories like biblical stories are the ones that come to mind immediately. They have some lesson in there that's deeply human that you can understand, but it's put into a context that is interesting and entertaining. Anyway, Johnny kind of losing his mind and writing The House of Leaves does result in a cultural movement to a certain extent, and it results in Johnny being semi-famous, it seems. It is interesting that Karen going back into the house saves Will. I don't know completely what that means or what the symbolism is there. Maybe something similar to a mother's love, being unconditional, something that Johnny is dealing with in his own trauma, and that being something that you can kind of latch on to, and that can prevent you from being completely destroyed by all the badness surrounding trauma. The cops avoiding the hallways completely is kind of interesting. I think a lot of times cops aren't trained to deal with family trauma type things, so when people are having mental illness issues, they really just want to get out of the house or wherever they are and say, you know what, whatever this was, we aren't going to deal with it. Questions that kind of come up at the end of the story like what happened to the house and why didn't they bulldoze the house to see what was actually happening with it don't really need to be asked once you frame everything this way with the hallways being symbolic of trauma that the family is going through. There is mention of notes that Johnny put together that talk about early settlers coming in to the area where the Navidson house potentially exists and finding stairs in the woods. I 
don't completely understand what that means. I'm sure if I thought about it a bit, I could probably tie it together somehow, but for now, I'll just leave that note. One thing I think is interesting about the story that you realize in the five and a half minute hallway is Will going outside of the house and seeing that the exterior is no different than what it was previously is another interesting parallel with trauma where people not directly impacted by a death or some catastrophic event in somebody else's lives sees no external change, but the people impacted by it are severely impacted by it, by seemingly an invisible force. The Minotaur story and the story that Johnny tells last of the child dying in the hospital are kind of inversions of what is actually happening, where the child is the one with the illness, and I think that probably has some depth to it as well that I don't completely understand. I'm not a therapist. I don't know for sure the stages of grief or acceptance that children go through when they're going through a traumatic event, but I do think at some point it makes sense for a child to kind of think, is, is there something wrong with me? Is that why this is happening? So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the book itself and an analysis of literature in general and how this book kind of breaks some of the rules of, of what a book should be. With a book that is incredibly symbolic and has a lot of twists and turns and narrative complexity, it's easy to say, oh, that's a very snobby book, or for the book itself to come across as snobby. I think Infinite Jest has that problem. To some people, they start reading it and they're like, this is just a bunch of crap. This author was just showing off. Literature snobs like this stuff, but there's no reason for me to waste my time with it. I think House of Leaves doesn't have that problem as much because the framing mechanism is quite a bit different than what Infinite Jest uses. It's interesting, when I say snobby, I immediately think, well, yeah, I'm going to do something weird in my book, and then people that read it can say, oh, you know, you just didn't get it if you don't like it. And a lot of times that actually is a problem with the fan base, not with the author or what they're trying to do. If you enjoyed the book, you enjoyed the book. And really letting the fan base corrupt the book is it's an interesting thing that happens in a lot of different media when people become kind of tribal and want to own the thing by saying oh you don't understand what was actually happening there but the whole point is it is left up to your interpretation i think that's a major part of the book i think an important delineation for whether or not a book is just complicated for the sake of being complicated is whether or not it helps the book narratively do the departures from a normal book actually serve a purpose or is the writer just being cute? This is clearly subjective. You could think like, why doesn't Johnny just get the letters from his mom and go into a hallway himself? Why would Mark make it so much more complicated than that? When I first started making this video, I mentioned existential dread and then I kind of realized I don't know exactly what that means. So I looked it up on WebMD and it ties into exactly what Johnny is going through. The WebMD page says, symptoms of existential dread include anxiety, you may worry about the future or have anxiety that isn't tied to a particular concern. Depression, you may feel guilty about the past or hopeless about the future. Loneliness or isolation, you may feel that no one understands you or really cares about you. Lack of motivation or energy, Due to the feeling that nothing has meaning, you may pass on activities you once enjoyed. Obsessive thoughts. You may ask yourself the same questions over and over without arriving at any answers. With the way that I outlined the book, that's exactly what Johnny is going through. Johnny Truant is insane because his mom died. He lives at home and never takes a shower, and he writes insane things. Yeah, this is what Johnny goes through. It's not an adventure. It's not a fun exploration of unknown hallways. It's just miserable. The point is, as an artistic endeavor, did Mark succeed in making a book that was interesting and had purpose? And yeah, I think he did a great job. Again, I'm not a literary scholar. By any means, at least one individual enjoyed the story. And does this mean that you should like it if you really don't like this type of art? No. You can like whatever you want. Art is obviously incredibly subjective, and what you enjoy is, is your own. So some final questions and some clarification, some closing ideas for this video. Am I completely wrong in my interpretation? I don't think so, but like I said before, in the past when I have really tried to nail down analysis for things like this, I will miss major glaring things that the story is actually about, and I may have done that here. Will I ever read it again? Yeah, maybe, in like 10 years when I can't remember all the pieces of it as clearly. I really only read books repeatedly very rarely, like Sometimes a Great Notion and Blood Meridian are two books that I've read multiple times in the last 10 years, and that's really only three or four times, and I just like those books. <laughs> yeah, uh, another question you might be asking yourself is, why did you do such a bad job summarizing the book? 
if you think that, I am sorry. I haven't written a book report for over 20 years, and I did my best summarizing the book. Another question you might have if you've actually read the book yourself is, were there any sections that I completely skipped? And yeah, Appendix B, the Pelican poems I got to, and I was like, man, I just kind of want to be done with this book, so I'm skipping this section. Appendix F was kind of the same way. There's a bunch of quotes there, and I just skimmed them to see if there was something directly related to the story. But otherwise, I, I read everything. And I reread Johnny's mother's letters multiple times. Closing out the video, if anybody watched all of this, I'm amazed. Thanks. I really did this as a practice effort to see what it was like to make a longer YouTube video. It is hard. It's a lot of work. I have more admiration for people that do this consistently than I did previously. Will I ever make another video like this? Yeah, maybe. It was fun in ways. I still have a lot of work to do with editing, getting music into it. We'll see how fun all of that actually is. I think doing things that are hard is important, and this was difficult. Yeah, it might be my new hobby. We'll see. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Bye.